phase. Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. My name is Blake Cousins, and in this episode, we're going to release an amazing video sent to us by Open Minds TV at the UFO International Conference. Now let's take a look at this video right now. Please help me welcome Michael Schratt. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Open Minds for giving me the opportunity to join all of you today. And what I'd like to do for you this morning is give you a brief overview of Project Aquarius and give you some specific details regarding the interaction that Dr. Dan Burrish had with an extraterrestrial called JROG. And we've got some uh, very quick announcements before we begin here. Number one, the information drawings and illustrations highlighted in this presentation originated from directly the testimony and direction of Dr. Dan Burrish. So in other words, I didn't make this up. This comes directly from Dr. Dan Burrish. He will be available after this presentation to address all your questions. And number two is a disclaimer. The drawings and computer-generated forensic composite illustrations shown in this presentation do not conform 100% to Dr. Dan and Marcy's testimony or descriptions and should be considered strictly as a visual aid specifically designed to give the general public an overall idea of what the S4 facility looked like. So in other words, I didn't get this 100% correct. There are some minor errors here and there in the renderings, but it's definitely sufficient to give all of us here today a good understanding and visual aid regarding what the S4 facility looked like. Now this is the breakdown of what we'll be talking about today. I'll give you a background of Dr. Dan Burrish. We'll be discussing level 4-1. We'll be talking about walking the line. We'll describe what that actually means, what it pertains to. I'm going to give you a virtual blueprint floor-by-floor walkthrough of the nine hangar base and all the way through the facility. We'll consider the extraterrestrial and alien craft because there is a difference. We'll talk about the Roswell craft. We'll talk about the propulsion research laboratory at S4. We'll consider the catwalk, the files department, and the cafeteria. For level 4-2, we'll consider Project Sidekick, the weapons research and development, Alice in Wonderland Rabbit, this is a good historical note, Looking Glass Device, Stargate's ERBs or Einstein Rosen Bridges, the Doctrine of Convergent Timeline Paradox. Dropping down to level 4-3, we'll consider the MJ-12 residential suites, the boardroom, the culture department, and analysis department. 4-4, we'll look at the weighing pads, the biocontainment labs, badge board, and decontamination procedure. And finally, on level 4-5, which is the lower floor of the facility, We'll consider the clean sphere, the scissor lift, the lighting, the iris aperture, the kick plates, airlock, and the test, which is the totally encapsulated suit. So that's the layout of what we'll be talking about today. So who is Dr. Dan Bursch? He was the youngest person ever to be elected into the Los Angeles Microscopical Society. And in 1985, he received his bachelor degree in biological sciences, and in 1986, a bachelor degree in psychology. In 1987, Dan explored the feasibility of becoming a priest here at St. Patrick's School of Theology. However, that didn't quite work out, so we actually had to bypass that. Now, in 1989, it was Dr. Edward Teller who arranged for Dan to take classes at the University of New York, Stony Brook, and he earned his PhD there. So I ask this question to all of you. Where have we seen this gentleman before? Dr. Edward Teller, where have we seen him come up in the stories of, of these type craft and vehicles before? It was none other than Dr. Teller who arranged for, allegedly, Bob Lazar to get his interview at EG&G at McCarran International Airport, and that's how he got his job at S4. So we have secondary independent confirmation that Dr. Edward Teller was involved. In 1991, he was employed at Desert Storm as a biowarfare expert. 
Now, in 1994, he received his Q clearance at S4, and he began working on something called Project Aquarius. And I will draw your attention here to the aircraft sectional chart that anyone can get at any local airport. This is something that's readily available. And if you look up here on the right-hand corner, you've got R-4808N. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most highly guarded airspace, Dreamland airspace in America. This is the borderline here. You'll notice Groom Lake is right up here, so we can see it does exist. Approximately 12 miles south of Groom Lake, there's something called Papoose Lake or Area S4. And it's important to note that if you ever try to break into this airspace within the 4808N airspace Dreamland, three things immediately happen. Number one, ATC at Dreamland, air traffic control, will not allow you clearance to enter into their airspace. Number two, they will immediately, if you do not egress the area, they will immediately scramble an F-16 who will perform a particular maneuver where they'll fly perpendicular to your flight path at about 100 feet away from your aircraft, and then when you fly into his jet wash, it will either depart from controlled flight or you might end up wrecking one of your wings or tearing one of your wings off. So that's the second thing. And the third and final thing is you'll receive a final warning to exit the area, and if nothing happens, they will lock on with a Sidewinder missile and they will neutralize the target. So the bottom line is don't try to break into Dreamland airspace. Okay, so at S4, again, he received his clearance, and he worked under the direction of the Naval Research Laboratory and the Defense Intelligence Agency. So these are the two outfits that are running the program at Area S4. The EG&G terminal, 737-200, how do you get to Area S4? Well, it's the eg and terminal, which is the gateway to Area 51 and S4. As you're flying on this airliner here, just before the hairpin turn into the landing approach on Groom Lake Runway, which is a 27,000 foot runway, it's the largest runway in the world, there's an ATC clearance called Pyramid, Pyramid, Pyramid. That is the clearance to land at Groom Lake. And what's interesting, a historical point from Dan Burrish indicated that on the trip on the 737-200 to Groom Lake, they played Neil Diamond's song, Coming to America, over and over and over again. So the question is, what is the encrypted symbolic message that they're playing on the airplane as you're going there? Well, under its original interpretation, that song talks about immigrants coming to America to make a better life for themselves. That makes a lot of sense. But under the direction of what happens at S4, it actually is talking about extraterrestrials coming to America and specifically coming to S4. That was confirmed by Dan Bursch as the correct interpretation. Now, when you land at Groom Lake, how do you get to S4? It's 12 miles away. There's three ways. You can take a blue-colored Air Force bus. That's number one. Number two, you take a U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopter. The third and final option is a Russian Mi-24 Hindi helicopter gunship. So those are the three options that you take to get to S-4. Now we're flying, we've just landed, we're at the helicopter landing pad, we're now going to enter the facility for a virtual walkthrough. And you'll notice that there are some very interesting lines here on the tarmac. We have two parallel red lines, okay? And then there are two parallel blue lines. This is called walking the line. And you are told, according to Dan Burrish, and this is a very oppressive society, it's not a user-friendly area. It's not something that is a, a nice place to be at because there's black uh, guards with guns and it's an oppressive society. You are told to follow the blue lines and do not breach the boundaries of the red lines, because if you do, ladies and gentlemen, they will shoot you. That's the level of security that we're talking about here. Now, we're entering the facility, and you'll see this uh, swinging door to enter the, the facility. It turns out that that is actually incorrect, so we've made the correction. 
the actual door to get into the S4 facility is none other than a double sliding glass door with an indented receptacle which is circular. You turn that to the right, that's how you get into the facility. Very similar to what you would see on your patio door. Now we've got the layout. We start at the top, it's 4-1. Second floor is 4-2. We've got 4-3, 4-4, and 4-5. We flip to the AutoCAD rendering to give you an idea of what that facility looks like. Keep in mind that anything below 4-1 is all underground. Now, area S4, 4-1. This is the blueprint that I was able to put together under the direction of Dr. Dan Burrish. And if the first thing that happens when you walk in this facility, you enter that door, what you see is this long hallway here, very long hallway. It has the same type line configuration or stripes on the floor. To the left, you'll see a, re a red line. You cannot go to the left. On the, on the right, there's a blue line. You can get access to that. So we're walking up here. The first room to the left, ladies and gentlemen, is actually the uh, avionics lab. Just beyond that is the propulsion systems lab. Over here we have a files department and we have something called the briefing room. This is a very important room, the, the briefing room. Why? Because there's something called King Tut's or training update tapes and they have something called blue three ring DTIC binders which is defense technical and information center binders. So I just submit We've all heard this thing about Carl Sagan stating that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, here's where the evidence is. In this facility, they not only have the hardware, but they've got the tissue samples, they've got the motion picture film reels, they've got the high visual digital audio tapes. It's all here. This is what we're looking for. So, on the far western wall, on the interior of each of the nine hangar bays, there is a 4-1 in red paint circled by a red circle. So that indicates that you are at area S4, floor 1. That's the significance there. The first hangar bay, which is right here, this is hangar bay number 1, was none other than Bob Lazar's sport model or a P-45 sport model. Hangar bay number two, we believe to be the exact same vehicle or possibly an ARV alien reproduction vehicle. Hangar bay three, ladies and gentlemen, was the Roswell craft, which was covered by a tarp, so Dan get, didn't get to see the entire configuration, but it was the Roswell craft. Next we have, in the next hangar, which is number four, is the P-52 Orion craft. The next hangar bay five was empty. Hangar Bay 6 contained a man-made F-22 conversion or sort of a dog and pony show of what was in Hangar Bay 3. So it was a man-made version of the Roswell craft. Up here we have, it's believed to be the 1953 crash retrieval in Kingman, Arizona. That was what was in the next hangar, which is 7. Hangar Bay 8 contained a black isosceles triangle that was nicknamed the licorice drop. Hangar Bay 9, ladies and gentlemen, was empty. So that's the layout here. Up on the left-hand corner, I've got a very crude gymnasium lighting. That's the important thing to remember. When you're in this facility, it's not impeccable lighting on the first floor. So that's why we have that. Moving over to the right, we have the biohazard suppression area. We have the overflow files department. And then we have the communication area. And then you'll look over to the bottom right here is the meals ready to eat or the cafeteria. And you'll notice here that the different colors indicate the compartmentalization of the people who work on different programs at Area S4. So if you work on Project Sidekick or if you work on Project Galileo, you sit in the red area. If you work on weapons research, you sit in the black area. As we mentioned, orange area is Project Looking Glass. So what they're doing is they're quarantining the employees and engineers who work on the different programs so that these things remain secret. Okay, so this is a far look down of the main hallway. As soon as you walk in, you see that red stripe and the blue stripe on the right-hand side. We've got the avionic, avionics lab and the propulsion system labs on the immediate left-hand side. Now, right to the left, there is an I want to believe poster confirmed by Dr. Dan Burrish. Over to the right, there is a 
a, uh, a nurse there and a weighing pad. So all this talk about trying to smuggle things out of S4 so that we can prove all this is real, well, it's next to impossible. Why? Because they weigh you in the nude when you get there and they weigh you in the nude when you get out. And there's, if there's a discrepancy within ounces, it's over. So you've got to be very careful here. Now, 4-1, looking down through the catwalk to the left-hand side. This is the first hangar bay is the 52-foot diameter Bob Lazar sport model. So this is, we're looking down through the catwalk. Over here we have Hangar Bay 2, which again is believed to be the same craft or an alien reproduction vehicle. Hangar Bay 3 is the P-24 Roswell craft. You'll notice the 4-1, we're at Area S-4, Level 1. Now, this is interesting. I did not make this statement, but Dr. Dan Burrish and even the late geologist Dr. Phil Schneider indicated that hmm, the F-22 Raptor, the exterior configuration of the F-22 Raptor was originating from the original Roswell craft. That's a very bombshell statement to make, but if you take away the vertical stabilizers on the F-22 Raptor and then you remove the air intakes and then you do something what Dan Burrish told me, is if you drew a spline curve and connected all of the major points or intersecting areas on the Raptor, what you'd end up with, ladies and gentlemen, is the Roswell craft. So this comes directly from Dan Burrish. Is there any way to prove this? Well, take a look at the historical legacy on the origin point of stealth technology. And we'll start up here. There is a defining feature that goes through all these configurations. You've got the FB-22 up here. We've got a Russian stealth configuration here. Down here to the left, we've got a Northrop configuration. Just to the right of that, we've got the Testers Model Corporation, Rockford, Illinois, the F-19 configuration by Lockheed, and then we've got the configuration from the movie Stealth, which was released in 2005. All these configurations contain the same design model. In fact, they contain the same wing root to fuselage joint, which is completely integrated and smooth contoured, identical to the B-2 stealth bomber to reduce the radar cross signature. That is the defining design feature on these stealth technologies, the same thing you'll see in the Roswell craft. Hangar Bay 4 was a P-52 Orion craft. This is the original configuration. This is the cleaned up configuration on the bottom side by Dr. Dan Burrish. Hangar bays 5 and bays 9 were empty. And you'll notice, too, that there are these interesting tracks here, and these were used to pull the craft out of the hangar bays so that they could be test flown on the tarmac immediately from the entrance of the facility. Hangar bay 6 was the man-made reproduction of the P-24 Roswell craft that was in hangar bay 6. Hangar bay 7, again, that Dan believed, but not could be completely confirmed that this was the 1953 Kingman UFO crash retrieval vehicle was covered by a tarp. Hangar Bay 8 contained a black isosceles triangle. They called it the licorice drop, according to, to Dan Burrish. And I will mention that everything from Hangar Bay 1 to Hangar Bay uh, 7 were all extraterrestrial vehicles. Hangar Bay 8 was the only alien vehicle because there's a difference between extraterrestrials and aliens. And according to Dr. Dan Bursch, the exterior configuration or what it looked like when you saw this craft, it looked like a black liquid mercury that you could fall into. It was a very unique surface texture on this particular craft. So we've got Bob Lazar stating that S-4 exists. That's what he said back in 1988, 1989. We've got Dr. Dan Burrish coming forward stating that S-4 exists. We also have Bill Uhouse who worked on the flight simulators at S-4 and at Los Alamos National Lab. So we've got three independent people confirming the same thing. You'll see the cutaway AutoCAD drawing originating from Bill Uhouse indicating that there was a flight simulator, a flying saucer flight simulator that was attached to a gimbal mount and you could rotate this thing almost up to 90 degrees. There was a diagnostic cable attached to the vehicle when it was static, 
But when it was energized, the diagnostic cable gets released, and then you could quote unquote fly the vehicle at that time. So the P45 craft was the sport model, measured 52 feet in diameter. It was 16 feet high. It had a smooth, polished aluminum exterior configuration. And then I want to take you inside here, show you some of the interior components. It had three different levels. We've got the lower bay, we've got the mid deck, and the upper deck. So that's what we've got right there. Now let's zoom inside. We'll take a look at what it looks like inside. On the bottom section of the vehicle, there were three gravity amplifiers. Right above that, we have the mid deck which contained three gravity amplifier heads, three seats that all sat in the same direction, which were too small for human test pilots to fit into. Then we've got a gravity amplifier system here. We've got a antimatter reactor and a waveguide that goes all the way up through the mid deck and what we believe to be the avionics or navigation department right here, and these are not windows. So that's the layout of the sport model according to <clears throat> Mr. Bob Lazar. Now, spend 15 seconds on the propulsion system of this vehicle. Element 115 is machined into triangles at Los Alamos, transported to S4. It is loaded into the antimatter reactor, and then the target substance is bombarded with protons. And when a proton plugs into the nucleus of an atom of element 115, it bumps its atomic number up to element 116 which immediately decays and releases antimatter. That is the power source for the vehicle in a near 100% thermoelectric generator. So that's a breakdown of the propulsion system. Project Aquarius terminology. Let's talk about some terminology here. Project Galileo. Project Aquarius is nothing more than an umbrella term for everything having to do with mankind's interaction with extraterrestrials. Below that, there are about five different programs. The first one is Project Galileo. It dealt with the propulsion system of extraterrestrial and future terrestrial vehicles. So that was the first one. Second one under Project Aquarius was Project Sidekick. Relates to a weapons program. No further information is available from Dan Burrish on that program. Project Looking Glass dealt with the physics of seeing the effects of an artificially produced gravity wave on time. The fourth project was a second generation weapons program which originated with Project Sidekick, no program name provided. The fifth program dealt with a series of biological defense operations which Dan served in the capacity of senior scientist. So those are the programs that fell under Project Aquarius. <clears throat> so how did the J-Rod craft, or what was termed the Kingman 1953 UFO crash retrieval, how did it get to S4? Ladies and gentlemen, it got there by a 40 ton, what's called a dragon wagon tank hauler. That's how they got it there to the facility. Now, in 1953, according to Dr. Dan Bursch, there was a UFO crash retrieval at Kingman, Arizona. There were three bodies recovered. One died on impact. He was still contained to his biocontainment device. The other one went to Los Alamos, and the third and final one went to Area 51 S4. That's the J-Rod that Dan Burrish worked with. Now, in 1954, according to Dan Burrish, there was a meeting between President Dwight D. Eisenhower and representatives of the P-52 Orions, and a treaty was signed. A copy of that treaty was kept at Area S4 Level 4-1, and they also gave him, they gave President Eisenhower something called the Orion Cube, which we'll talk about as well. What is the Orion Cube? It was also known as the Yellow Book. It has nothing to do with phone numbers, okay? What it is, is it's a eight by eight inch square cube, and it's a quantum viewing device that you could, once it's accessed, you could look at the probabilities of future events. There was protocols that had to be followed in order to activate this. And at one time, it's believed that this cube was stored at level 4-1. Later, it was moved to the Scottish Rite Masonic Temple just outside Washington, D.C. From that point further, we don't know where it is. So that's the lineage of the Orion Cube. Now, interesting to note that there are three events that took place in 1947. Is there a coincidence? I don't think there is. We've got the Roswell crash 
on July 2nd, 1947. Then we've got the formation of the CIA in 1947 and the formation of the Independent Air Force also in 1947. Three events happening at the same time. In 1952, it was the National Security Agency who, according to the CIA, had improper intelligence, so partial majestic control of Project Aquarius was handed over to the, quote, new boys on the block because they came after the Central Intelligence Agency. So there was this animosity that continues today between the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency. Now, moving down to 4-2, we've got the solid works rendering and also the AutoCAD rendering of 4-2. Moving into the facility, the first thing you'll see when you look and walk into level 4-2 is a three-foot-tall statue of an Alice in Wonderland rabbit. There's a symbolic message that they're giving you here. There's a primary looking glass device, and then on either side of that primary looking glass device, ladies and gentlemen, there are two secondary ERBs or Einstein-Rosen bridges. Up on the left, I've got a graphic of what we have termed the galactic positioning codes, because when you access a Stargate at the S4 facility, you don't need to have a galactic positioning code on your arm or flip book, because all that data is inside the control room. But when you go outside S4, you do need to get this uh, positioning code data so that you know where you're going. Here we've got the uh, jump pads at 4-2. And then down here, we've got the Project Sidekick storage facility. There's also one just below that. To the right, we've got weapons research and development. I've got a blown up view of the looking glass device here. We're going to consider something called the Doctrine of Convergent Timeline Paradox. And then we're also going to consider how did the US government get the technology to access naturally occurring stargates throughout the world? It has to do with the Sumerian cylinder seals that were recovered in Baghdad years ago. Now, this is a SOLIDWORKS rendering of the looking glass device. You'll notice that there's this toroid or donut ring-shaped device. And inside this, we have multiple permanent electromagnets. And this is consistent with six electromagnetic fields that form above this uh, device. There is a up and down actuating rotating cylinder, so it's a height adjustable rotating cylinder which is attached to a three axis gimbal system. That's the general layout of the looking glass device. Now what does this thing do? Well, it can actually warp the fabric of space time both forwards and back and you can actually see the probabilities of future events. That's the primary function. However, there's a secret to the looking glass device, which Dan Burrish has told us. What you can do is you can flip this device up at 45 degree angle, and if you tune it to a slightly different frequency, it can be used as a stargate. So it actually has a dual purpose. You've got these spires or guide rings just above the looking glass device. These are used to guide the electromagnetic field over the looking glass device. It's something that you can hit with your hand. Now, per Dan's comments, there was a three foot tall statue of an Alice in Wonderland rabbit. He had a maroon vest, he had golden fringes, and he had black buttons. He was holding a clock. And this is symbolic that you're going down the rabbit hole into a world that's beyond belief. And that's exactly what happens in the looking glass area. So it was a symbolic encrypted message. Now, when we talk about time travel and we talk about the doctrine of convergent timeline paradox, in my assessment, there is no better illustration of this concept than the movie Back to the Future 2. And they talk about this in that movie. So just to illustrate this, for example, on the bottom here, we've got something called the flow of time representative of the bottom arrow or timeline one. That's the timeline we're on. So we're moving down this timeline and everything is fine, everything is great, and then somebody, somebody decides to flip on one of these looking glass devices, and this is called the looking glass point of observation. That's right here. Now, we have someone that is looking into the future of probable events. At that point, at that exact point in time, 
We are no longer, ladies and gentlemen, on timeline one, but we are now on timeline two, and we have, theoretically, we have affected our future timeline one. So that's how this works. Now, in this movie, a DeLorean is used to go from the year 1985 to the year 2015, and a character by the name of Biff Tanyan, he eventually comes into possession of something called the Gray Sports Almanac, 1950 to 2005. He picks this up from an 80s memorabilia store. He goes back to the year 1985, and it's, it's a cakewalk. He knows all the results, all the sports scores, to the horse racing, to NFL, to hockey. He turns out to be a billionaire. It's just incredible. But in the process of doing that, he completely destroys himself, everyone he's with, and everything, all the surroundings. So you can see of the catastrophic consequences of looking into the future, it has a very serious consequence. And that's borne out by what we see here with the Mayan calendar. Some believe, ladies and gentlemen, that on December 21st of 2012, it's the end of the world. However, some take a more positive approach and indicate that this is a new dawning of an age of enlightenment. And this is, if we flip over to the prophecy rock by the Hopis here, they have a similar motif. They talk about the evolution of mankind's consciousness on this bottom straight line, and then something happens. An event takes place where we go off into chaos, and that's what you see with this squiggly line. So again, it's very destructive in some cases to try to predict future events. It can have catastrophic consequences. Here you see the uh, rendering, 3D Max Studio rendering of the looking glass device. We've got the transport pads in this location. Everything that took place in this facility was recorded on digital videotape. So they have the evidence. There's no question about it. You can see the electromagnetic fields forming above the looking glass device. There was a stand clear yellow and black stripe that followed the circumference of the looking glass device. Now again, this is Dan Burrish's rendering. We talked about the looking glass configuration. It's the general configuration on the upper left-hand corner. And then on the upper right-hand corner, we've rotated the device 45 degrees from the horizontal, and now it's in the, quote, Stargate configuration. So that's what we see there. The flip book, this was something that engineers wore on their arms, and it was kind of a GPS code book because you have to know where you are and where you're going when you operate or access one of these Stargates. Now, some of you may have seen the movie Stargate. The actual Stargate looks nothing like what you see in the movies. The only thing that is consistent is this metal catwalk that gets you into the actual Stargate. That's the only similarity in the entire operation. Level S4, level 3. We're moving on to level 3. This is the SolidWorks rendering. Below, we have the AutoCAD rendering. Now, there are at least three primary areas to 4-3. You'll notice that there are three distinct segments here. Each has four residential suites. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Majestic 12 residential suites. That's where they stay when they get to S4. It consists of a very simple one-bedroom apartment with a sunken living area. There's a tile walkway to enter the facility. There's a single TV. There's one single bathroom. So that's the S4 Majestic 12 residential suite. You also know that we've got the culture department, we've got the analysis department just to the right and below the culture department. Up here on the right, we've got the, the callouts, the leader callouts. We've got slider trays, we've got pressure incubators. And when I was going through this, it, it really dawned on me that there's a lot of attention to detail here, and it was my assessment that this was coming from a man who had practical application experience in working in this environment. I mean, it just seemed to me that you couldn't make this up. There was a lot of detail here. It really seemed that this was someone who could speak from experience that was actually working in the facility. <clears throat> now, level 4-4, that's where we're moving on to now. A number of primary areas here. We have the badge board. This is a blow up of the badge board on 4-4. We've got a, a meeting room or a board room in that facility. There are multiple biocontainment labs in level 4-4 and we'll zoom in and blow up that area right here. These are the decontamination areas 
and Dan Burrish's desk at S4, level 4-4, was right in this facility right here. So again, the level of attention to detail to me was just astounding. Really seemed like someone who was actually working there. Now, some of you may have seen this before. This is Dan Burrish's uh, security badge at S4. We've got MADGE here, that's short for Majestic, that was the program that was operated under Truman in 1947. And then we've got these diagonally striped blue and darker blue running along the upper left-hand corner. This is the same configuration that Bob Lazar talked about as well. So again, we've got secondary independent confirmation that there was a security badge that actually looked like that. His badge number was H6196MAJ. Level 4-5, very important floor. This is the clean sphere floor. And you'll notice that there is an iris. This iris can move out for the clean sphere floor. You've got these orange cables going across, across the clean sphere. And they are to suspend the, quote, beehive lights. There was a boardroom on the right side, one boardroom on the left side. And then we've got the actuation of the actual clean sphere floor. So what does this thing actually look like? Before you get into the clean sphere, there's multiple protocols that have to be followed. This is the entire layout of the protocols. The 4-5 gantry vehicle and overview of clean sphere entry protocol. So you've got the totally encapsulated suit that you have to contend with. You have to have a positive pressure environment in that suit and the umbilical cords that take place at this stage are integrated into the clean sphere. Now, detail views. We've got the PINS device. What did Dan Burrish do when he got there? He worked with this PINS device, which is the pressure-induced needle system. He carried a briefcase with him when he got into the airlock, which gained access to the clean sphere. Down here, I've got the representation of the 40-ton dragon wagon tank hauler. Shows you how they got the craft to the facility. And this is a rendering of the airlock here. This is a layout of what the 4-5 facility looks like. So picture in your mind's eye a large square building, somewhat similar to what we have here. And in all four corners, you'll have this fillet radius. So the corners aren't sharp, but they're blended really nicely. And then. On the lower floor, you've got something called a scissor lift. It's the same type of scissor lift you see in uh, manufacturing, in construction sites. And just above that, of course, we've got a hydraulically actuated scissor lift. There's a floor with a large circular cutout with something called the clean sphere. And the clean sphere, ladies and gentlemen, is not a complete sphere. It's like an orange cut in half, so it's strictly a half of a sphere. That's what we'll be considering here. Here you see the SolidWorks rendering of the clean sphere device and then the scissor lift, almost identical to what you would see at your local airport with these concession trucks that bring this uh, box up to the 747 cargo bay and then bring in the meals. That's the same type configuration that you would see at the bottom of 4-5. Here's the rendering of what the clean sphere actually looked like. It was 52 feet across. The plexiglass clear bubble was two inches thick. Think about the manufacturing that had to take place to get that there. Just an incredible level of engineering. Impeccable lighting was located on 4-5, which is different than level 4-1. There were seven indented windows, or Majestic 12 observation gallery windows. They measured two and a half feet wide four and a half feet tall. So there were seven of those so that you could look down inside the clean sphere as you're taking tissue samples from the J-Rod. That's what we see here. Now we've got something called the beehive lights. These beehive lights could actually move along trapeze cables. They could be lowered and raised through a telescopic device. And these were actually designed and built by J-Rods and the S4 engineers just an impeccable level of lighting on 4-5. Why is that needed? Because you don't want any shadows when you're taking tissue samples from an extraterrestrial. Here you can see the edge of the 4-5 uh, floor, which is in the yellow and black stripe right here, and then also the edge 
of the clean sphere bubble right here. That's what we're indicating in this illustration. Now, there's something called kick plates that actually are manually operated and they seal the gap between the clean sphere edge and the floor of 4-5, the opening. That's what they do. And according to Dan Burrish, these were done by hand manually and when you slam these down, there's a big bang that takes place. So it's something that he really stressed. Here we see the scissor lift lifting the clean sphere up to the second floor of 4-5. And then you can see again the hydraulically actuated scissor lift. Now, we're talking about the TESS or totally enclosed suit, similar to what you would see in the Gemini, Mercury, even the Apollo program of 1969. It's a positive pressure suit to keep out biocontaminants. That's actually its job. And when Dan Burrish was at 4-5 inside the clean sphere, he was taking upwards of 300 tissue samples from the J-Rod because he suffered from a genetic neuropathy defect. And the overall program was to find a cure for that genetic defect. And one way they did that is to use this pressure-induced needle system that Dr. Dan Burrish personally told me was very small. He called it a Saturday night special. And it had a pneumatically actuated hose off the aft end of the pins device. There was a small cartridge that was loaded right inside the shaft here, and you could take the tissue samples that was sent up to the analysis department. So that's how they did that. He also carried a briefing case with him with multiple needles and cartridges that went inside the clean sphere as well. Now again, remember, <laughs> They weigh you in the nude when you get in, then when you drop down to 4-5, they weigh you in the nude again. So there's just no way you're gonna sneak anything out of 4-5. This is a very well done pencil sketch by Mark McCandlish, who is again the world's premier aerospace illustrator, showing Dan Burrish being suited up in the test suit and then entering the airlock or decontamination chamber for entry into the clean sphere. Now, what in the world does J-Rod mean? I mean, what we've heard this before. In its simplest terms, J-Rod means 15 because J on the computer keyboard is the 10th letter in the English language. The dash or rod was symbolic of the Mayan glyph that indicated the number five. So you put those together, you get 15. That's also symbolic because he traveled from 15 light years away to get to Earth. So that's the definition of J-Rod and how he got his name. Now, two quotes from Dan Burrish that are very important. He said, I have never met an alien, but I have met an extraterrestrial. The difference being that an extraterrestrial such as a J-Rod is actually a future human and therefore shares a same human lineage. A true alien, on the other hand, would bear no such human lineage. So that's the difference between an extraterrestrial and an alien. Now, when he was working there, you can see him with the pins device taking samples from the J-Rod. And he was called Kaela, a little bit of description of what he looked like. He measured three and a half feet tall. He had dark brown appearance, very black inset eyes, a disproportionately large head. He had a small nose, long arms, and no teeth. Interesting to note that the designation for this particular J-Rod was EBE dash 53AZ2. That stands for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity, 1953 UFO Crash Retrieval, Kingman, Arizona, number two. Because remember, the first one died on impact, the other one went to a Y-11 facility at Los Alamos. Now, during one of these tissue sample sessions, remember, you have to follow a certain protocol to approach this J-Rod. You have to raise up your right hand, the J-Rod raises his right hand, and then you take multiple bride steps together, and then you meet in the center. During one occasion within the clean sphere, the J-Rod, who was known as Kayla, he broke the protocol, rushed Dan, and they had developed a friendship at this time, so this had never happened before, and he wasn't under attack, but Dan Bursch was startled about what took place. He stepped back and accidentally caught his boot of the total encapsulated suit on the grid structure of the bottom of floor of 4-5, and he tripped over backwards on his oxygen tank, 
oxygen tank, and the J-Rod proceeded to infuse into him a tremendous amount of material having to do with future events. So it's incredible what took place inside the clean sphere. This is an illustration by Mark McCandless showing the decontamination process within the airlock for entry into the 4-5 facility. Now, again, how did they get this technology to access these naturally occurring stargates? Ladies and gentlemen, they got those from the Sumerian cylinder seals, in some cases from the Baghdad Museum. Now, what you'll do here is you'll take a piece of wet clay and you'll roll that over the clay, the cylinder seal, and you'll end up with this positive relief. Now, according to Dan Burrish, what the government figured out how to do is you take a mirror, go right down the center line of one of these glyphs, and you get a mirror image, which is nothing more than a blueprint on how you access these naturally occurring stargates. That's how they did it. That's how they did it. Now, in 2003, something interesting happened. J-Rod was moved from his position within the Clean Sphere 4-5 facility. He was flown to Abydos Temple, which is down the Nile River. Perhaps some of you have been, been there, actually. And remember, he has to be in his own positive pre pressure atmospheric environment or he'll die. So they ended up building a stroller for him. This is Dr. Dan Burrish's illustration of what that stroller actually looked like. And re recall, too, that they were friends at the time. So Dan Burrish was sad that J-Rod could not go home to his family and be with his family. He had a compassion for him. So in this act of compassion, during the accessing by the government of one of these naturally occurring stargates at Abydos Temple, Dan Burrish thrust forward that stroller and pushed Kayla into this stargate sending him home. However, Dan and the stroller device were kicked out. He got into a lot of trouble for this, but it was an act of compassion on Dr. Dan Burrish. There is a very interesting piece of nostalgia at the end of Groom Lake Runway, according to Dan Burrish. There is a sign there that has multiple arrows pointing in every direction, and the sign says home. And this is a symbolic message that what takes place at S4, perhaps Groom Lake, home is underground, it's in outer space, it's north, it's east, it's west, home is everywhere. There's a symbolic encrypted message being employed in this symbol here. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's really important that we honor the courage that Dan Burrish had to come forward and give us this information regarding the specific details of the S-4 facility and providing all of us a potential for a, for a very bright future which is on the nearby horizon and I want to thank you for your attention. We want to thank Open Minds TV for submitting their amazing video right here at Third Phase of Moon. And if you've captured anything amazing in regards to UFOs, you can contact us via Skype or Facebook. My name is Blake Cousins, and we'll see you again next time.